Our Bible reading this evening comes from James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Starting at verse 12. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, or you will be condemned. Thanks, Martin. Uh, it is just a short reading. When I saw one verse, I thought maybe I should have done it. Uh, but you did it better than I could have done, Martin. So thank you for reading one verse. Um, it's really difficult when I go, whoa, you spread out today. It's really difficult when you get to the section in James. And just because it doesn't fit in the preceding context, it doesn't fit in the succeeding context. And so it's kind of a, a standalone verse. Um, which makes it a little bit difficult for the preacher. And when he says above all, that's not referring back. That's just saying this is the conclusion beginning or the beginning of the conclusion of the letter. So we're sitting with one verse. We should be out so early this evening, but you know better. So we're going to pray and ask for the Lord's help as we seek to understand uh, this and how it applies. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so grateful that you have given us a revelation of yourself in your word. We recognize that sometimes we read your word without it really penetrating into the depths of our soul. And yet everything you've given us is profitable in some way for our spiritual walk with you and for our lives as we live them out in this world. And so we don't want to allow your word just to wash over us without it having any kind of cleansing effect upon us. But we want to pray that as we come under your word, that we would always be quick to obey it, quick to apply it, and that we would do so joyfully, enthusiastically, recognizing it's a privilege to be in a relationship with you and to have such access to your word. So help us this evening, we pray. Give us insight where we lack, and we ask that you would change us. For Jesus' sake, amen. A store manager was heard to tell a customer, no ma'am, we haven't had any of that for a while, and it doesn't look like we'll be getting any of that soon. Have you been into a shop where you've heard that? especially nowadays with the shortage of things. Horrified, the manager came running up to the customer and said, of course we'll have some soon. We placed an order last week. The manager drew the clerk aside and said, never, he snarled. Never, never, never say we're out of anything. Say we've got it on order and it's coming. Now, what is it that she wanted? The clerk answered, rain. Rain. Sometimes our lies catch us out, don't they? Sometimes when we don't tell the truth, we get away with it. No one knows and our lies at one level succeed, but there is one who sees everything. And sometimes it's hard to tell the truth, isn't it? Sometimes when we are under pressure and it may cost us, it may embarrass us, it may cause rebuke because we've done something that we ought not to have done. It can become difficult to tell the truth. We have so many examples of people not telling the truth in the Bible. For example, when Abraham is uh, camping out with his wife and the king sees his beautiful wife and comes and asks about her, Abraham says, lie, tell him that you are my sister. That way, if he wants to take you, he won't kill me in the process, and I'll survive. There's a selfish motive. And then Abraham does it a second time. And we see lies throughout Scripture. Joseph's brothers, when they come to his father, and the, his father says, where's Joseph? And they hand him the blood cloak. They lie about what happened to Joseph. Joseph hasn't been killed. 
Joseph is alive. They've sold him into slavery. And so James writes this into a context where it's easy to be in a situation where those Christians who are being persecuted, who are under threat, who are under pressure, may choose to lie about something in order to protect themselves, in order to get out of a sticky situation. And so he writes this to them, reminding them, as in Christians, we have a responsibility before God to tell nothing but the truth. And he does this in three ways. Number one, I want you to notice the restriction. Verse 12a, the restriction. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear. Now, I want to explain what he means by do not swear. This is not how you and I would understand swearing today. Swearing for us is the use of foul language. And to some degree, foul language is determined culturally, though there are some universal words that are considered to be foul language. So if I may give one example, I'm not going to swear, but the word that we use in Australia sometimes, crap, right? That's not a swear word in Australia, but if you go to America and you use that word in America, it's a swear word. And so for them, they won't use that word. And yet the other word that is used to describe that same kind of stuff, starting with an S, in Australia is a swear word. In America, it's not. So I heard a preacher that you all know well, a well-known preacher, use the SH word in his preaching because it's not considered to be a swear word in America or Canada. So in some sense, swearing like that is culturally defined, though there are some universal words that apply to all cultures across the world. He's not talking about that. Now, that doesn't justify swearing. That doesn't mean because he's not saying it's, it's, that's not the context in which he is dealing with uh, th this particular subject, that swearing is okay. Example, Ephesians 4 verse 29 says to us, do not let any, listen to this, unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Um, and Jesus in Matthew 5 Verse 22 makes the point that we will be judged by the words we speak. Every word you speak is being heard by God, and God will judge us on the words that we have used and haven't used. Or in Matthew 12, 34 to 37, again, he speaks about the importance of words. So don't misunderstand what uh, James, he's not saying, well, it's okay for you to swear in that sense. But what he is saying is that there was a system by which the Israelites would verify certain things and they would swear an oath. It's the equivalent today, well, when I was growing up, maybe it's changed today, where as a child, when you wanted to really say something and convince your mates that what you were saying was gospel truth, you would say, my oath to God. And, or another equivalent would be putting your hand on the Bible and swearing on the Bible, or, which I've heard used quite frequently, I swear on my mother's grave. Now, as if your mother's grave somehow is going to make that true, what you're saying, uh, I don't know why it's the mother's grave and not the father's grave. But nevertheless, the system of oaths goes back to the Old Testament where there were no contracts. So today, we sign a contract. When you buy a house, you sign a contract for that. In those days, you entered into a verbal agreement, and then you would declare an oath that would bind you in that agreement. And James is saying that it's that misuse of those kinds of oaths that are a problem. Now, he's not saying it's wrong to take an oath. It's easy to misunderstand this text. So, for example, in Genesis 21, 20, uh, 25 to 
to um, 31, Abraham takes an oath to validate the, I have got the wrong stuff here, to validate the well that he digs. So Abraham digs a well and he, I must have picked up the wrong uh, sheet when I left home because it's got all the wrong verses on here that I've not recorded down here. Normally I'll type them out and put them on. Um, but it records the first oath that Abraham takes to validate the well that he digs. Or Joshua 2, 12 to 20. I'm just seeing if I've got any of them here. I've got that one. Okay. Now please swear to me by Yahweh that you will show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to me. Uh, you Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all who belong to them that you will save us uh, from our death. Our lives for your lives. This is Rahab. Remember Rahab? She says, swear by an oath that you will protect me. So it's not that oaths were wrong or uh, the oath between David and Jonathan. 1 Samuel 20, 12. Then Jonathan said to David, By Yahweh, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out my father by this time tomorrow. This is Saul wanting to kill David. Jonathan, a friend with David, says, I'll find out whether or not my dad is out for your blood. But if, my, if he is favorably disposed towards you, I will not send you word and let you know. But if my father is inclined to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away safely. May the Lord be with you as you, he has been with my father. Uh, and then he goes on to say, But show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord as long as I live so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with David, uh, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan and David reaff uh, made... Uh, and Jonathan made David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. Now, I could go on and mention a whole lot of more oaths, but that's the system in the Old Testament, verifying information. Now, there have been some bad oaths made. Can you think of one? Come on, my Bible study group, we're almost there. Can you think of one really bad oath that was made? That turned out an absolute disaster. It's in the book of Judges. That's right, Jephthah, right? Remember what Jephthah says? If you give me victory from the battle, the first person or the first thing I see, I will sacrifice. And what happens is the first thing he sees is his daughter. And he kills his daughter, which he should have never done because it was a stupid oath. But he does it because of the oath that he's made. So it's not intrinsically wrong to swear an oath by God's name. But what is wrong is where those oaths become frivolous. In other words, where they are superficial, where you are using them regularly and they don't have any meaning to them where they use as a kind of get-out-of-jail-free card to try and show that what you're doing is telling the truth. And so the oaths that were being sworn by these people had practically, practically become completely meaningless. And so James says, don't use oaths in that way. So let me ask you, when you enter into conversations with people. Are you like that? Can your word be trusted? Or are you always needing to use some form of verification of your word? Your mother's grave or whatever it might be. Secondly, I want you to notice the resolution, verse 12b. So, what's the resolution? Verse 12b. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, nor by heaven, nor by earth, nor by anything. Let your yes be yes, and your no, no. So James encourages his readers to resolve this by being people of integrity. In other words, he says, don't say one thing, and then do something completely different. 
Don't make a commitment and then break that commitment because you are not prepared to follow through with it. Now, we saw a little bit of this at our Baptist Union meeting that we had recently. There were certain things we affirmed by marriage, a concerning marriage, about the sanctity of marriage, about the fact that marriage has been a, between a man and a woman, and exclusively between a man and a woman, ruling out same-sex marriage. And then a little later in the day, which we never got round to voting for, there was the application of that first principle we had voted an affirmation of. And the application of that principle was saying if there are pastors or churches that cannot affirm that marriage is exclusively between one man and one woman, then the Baptist Union will take action to remove that church or remove that pastor from the Baptist Union. And as the discussion began to ensue about that particular application of the principle that had already been voted in favor, there were some who were opposed to it. And that's exactly what James is saying. Let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. But if you're going to say yes to something, then don't change your mind and say no about it sometime later. Ephesians 4 Verse 25, let's see if I've got this one. Ephesians 4, verse 25. No, I don't. I've got these all mixed up on here. I do have it. Therefore, each of you must put a falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are members of one body. Or John 14, verse 6. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth and the life. So tell the truth, to tell the truth is a matter of integrity, and Christians need to be people of integrity. We are living in a world right now where lies are freely propagated. You see this in the media. The media are quite comfortable with lying about something. Our politicians, not all of them, but some of our politicians quite freely lie. And quite freely will say one thing and then go back on it and do something completely different. Now, I don't have to tell you that. You've seen that unfold in Australian politics over the last few years. There will be no carbon tax, for example. We know that sometimes the politicians make guarantees that they cannot keep. Your electricity price is going to be reduced by $275. Now, tell me, whose electricity price is decreased this year? No one. Right? Those promises made, let your word, your yes be yes, and your no be no. Don't make promises you cannot keep. Don't say things unless you are willing to follow through with those things. And as children, you know what it's like when your parents promise you something and then they break the promise. James is saying, If you make a commitment, hold to it. Be people of integrity. Don't go back on your word. Sometimes it's costly. Sometimes it's hard to keep going uh, and and honoring the word that you've made. Sometimes it might cost you a friendship. It might cost you a promotion at work. It might cost you a position in a company. But for Christians, it's always the right thing. You know, there's a a wonderful story told about a racquetball player, um, Robert Gonzalez, in the final professional racquetball tournament of the year, final match of the year. It was his first shot at a victory on the pro circuit. Now, racquetball, if you don't know, is the American version of squash. It's not as good as squash, but it's similar to squash. So if you know what squash is, and if you don't know what squash is, come and speak to me afterwards, and I'll take you up to the court and show you. Uh, he, his very first shot at a victory on the pro circuit, and he was playing the perennial champion. In the fourth and final game at match point, Gonzalez made a super kill shot into the front wall to win it. The referee caught it good. 
One of the two linesmen affirmed that the shot was in. But after a moment's hesitation, Gonzalez turned around, shook his opponent's hand, and declared that his shot hit the floor first. As a result, he lost the match. He walked off the court. Everyone was stunned. Who could ever imagine it in any sport endeavor? A player with everything officially in his favor, with victory in his hand, disqualified himself at match point and lost. When asked why he did it, Ruben Gonzalez said, and I quote, It was the only thing I could do to maintain my integrity. He could win another match, but he could never win back his integrity if he cheated. Now, let me tell you, I play squash. And sometimes it gets quite tense on the squash court. And when you've got two people competing on that squash court, some calls get disputed. Because it's hard sometimes to see, and sometimes you're not sure whether you've just hit the top of the tin or whether you've hit the line, because on the line and squash is out. And it's very easy when you're 16 all and 17 is match point, and you've played two games all, and this is going to decide the set to call a shot in when no one else has been able to get a clear view of it that's been out. But integrity for a Christian means you will always make the right call. You will always tell the truth. You will always honor your commitment to Christ by demonstrating to the world that your integrity is not up for sale. One of the marks of a Christian is their honesty is the keeping of their word, no matter what it costs. So are you a man or woman of your word? What does your integrity look like? What does it look like behind closed doors when no one else is present with you? What happens when you're under pressure and you're being questioned? Do you fudge the truth? Someone once said, a half-truth plus a half-truth equals a whole lie. It's easy to leave out information, to conveniently leave it out, so that you create the wrong impression, when if you add it in the full picture, it would provide a completely different scenario. So what is it like with you? Is your yes, yes, or, and your no, no, or is this an area of great embarrassment in your life? And then thirdly, the reason, verse 12c, he gives us a reason. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no, or you will be condemned. Now, I want you to understand that the word he uses there for condemnation is a very strong word in the original language. It is a word that is used of judgment. And the judgment that he's talking about is not temporal judgment. This is not judgment that occurs within the church context or even outside in the secular context. No, the judgment he speaks of here is eternal judgment. This word is never used of the discipline of believers. So this matter is so important to God, which is why Jesus says in Matthew 12, you will be judged by your words, so important to God, that if you are a person who repeatedly allows your integrity to be compromised as a a person who proclaims to be a Christian, God says you stand condemned, you stand in eternal judgment under him. And so it's so important for us to maintain our integrity in that sense as Christians. It's so important for us to remember that we are dealing with a God who sees everything, a God who hears everything, a God who is eternally present wherever we go. 
And that God says, by your words, you will be judged. Now, that is not to say that our salvation becomes a matter of works. Don't misunderstand what James is saying. You are only ever saved by grace, and by grace alone through faith. There is no other way. But the application of that salvation or the reality of that salvation comes out in so many different ways. One of the ways we test or we can see whether or not we are saved is by whether or not we are people of integrity. And if you are not a person of integrity with your words, then you stand in a perilous position. Now, he's not speaking about those who may on occasion have an integrity problem. All of us, all of us without exception, lie occasionally, don't we? Is there anyone here who has never lied as a Christian? Who has never fudged the truth a little? Now, if there is, raise your hand because I want you to assure you that by raising your hand you will have just proved yourself to be a liar so you can join the rest of us he's not talking about that occasionally some of us may not tell the truth although we should always tell the truth but he's talking about someone who perpetually lies it's really interesting when I dealt with this in a bible study one day you know, not in this church, so there's no one in this church. You don't worry about trying to work out who. After the study was finished, I had one of the participants come to me, or one of the people in that study come to me afterwards and say, you know, Pastor, this really spoke to me because I often exaggerate and don't tell the truth. And I've realized how serious a matter this is. Are you prone to exaggeration? Martin Luther and I want to quote him said the following the first commandment thou shalt have no gods before me what does this mean answer we should fear love and trust God above all things second commandment thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain what does it mean answer we should fear and love God so that we do not curse swear conjure lie or deceive by his name but call upon him in every time of need and worship him with prayer praise and thanksgiving you are God's representative in this world Jesus will be judged on the way in which you present him to the world. And if you are guilty of presenting a lying Jesus, a deceiving Jesus, then that's what people will see Jesus to be. And so it becomes critically important for us as Christians to ensure that we don't allow ourselves to be caught up in compromising the truth but that we be remain and stay steadfast as people of integrity. Truth tellers. We don't bow to peer pressure. We don't agree when we feel as though the arguments that are being made for certain ethical positions that are contrary to the biblical position, we just cave into because it's easier just to agree with that. No, we hold fast to the truth because we are people of the truth. And when we give our word and when we speak, we always speak with integrity. So can I encourage you to be reminded of the reality of the importance of making sure that you say nothing but the truth at all times, in all places, in all different contexts, so that God may be honored. And if you don't, and if you are perpetually lying, you stand in a perilous position. Condemnation is what awaits. Let's pray. 
Our Father, we thank you for your word this evening. I pray that you would help us as your people to be those who have unimpeachable integrity. Whatever we do, may we be known by the reliability of our word so that our yes will always be yes and our no always be no. That whatever pressure is applied, whatever situation we find ourselves in, that we won't compromise the truth for the sake of getting out of something difficult, but that we would stand fast upon the truth and that whenever we speak, we will speak that which is right in your sight. So strengthen us to that end, I pray. And when we are tempted to bend the truth, to change it, to water it down, to alter it, or to outright lie, remind us that the stakes are high and keep us on the narrow path, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand.